Welcome to Social Psychology, where we'll talk about this huge subfield of psychology. We'll take a deep dive into some aspects of it, but only be able to skim the surface of many of the other different parts of social psychology that are out there. This and more to come. First, you can see social psychology has similarities to other fields. Sociology being the primary one, if we think about it in terms of a Venn diagram, we would see the circles from social psychology and sociology overlap, maybe about a quarter to a third. And if you've taken a social psychology class, you may already have seen some of the things that we'll talk about today, especially some of the key relevant historical studies in social psychology. But there are a lot of other fields that social psychology can overlap with as well. Any number of applied psychology, uh, including mine, industrial organizational psychology, often has many social psychology roots. The big question we can see is that we want to know how much and in what since circumstances do others' actions influence our thoughts and behaviors? Which times and under which situations are we particularly susceptible to the impact of other people's thoughts and actions? And other times we might be very insulated from the impact of others on us. So we'll explore a lot of different avenues that social psychology has gone down to answer this basic question. And once again, social psychology is a huge subfield and we can really only scratch the surface both here and in the textbook. So I would certainly recommend if you're interested in this topic, go on and take the social psychology class at BG or Firelands because it's really worth your time and I think is not only interesting, uh, but also readily accessible to applying to our own lives. But first, let's start with some true-false, as usual. Most of us would say, if we were told to hurt somebody who everybody knows is innocent and did nothing wrong, we would say, no, we would not do that because of our inner moral fiber. Something internal about us tells us not to do that. In reality, though, and we'll see this in the Milgram shock box obedience study, the majority of people put in a situation exactly like this, and we'll have to talk about how a lot of choices were made in the experimental design to crank up what we call situational pressure or situational salience or importance or pressure. And under those circumstances, many good people actually delivered what they thought would be a very injurious shock to people who were innocent. We also have the issue of how do you get people to be maximally motivated to do their best and to work their hardest? And as we see here, you might be able to guess that this is false due to what we call the social loafing effect. When our effort cannot be distinguished from the effort of those around us or our group or our team at work, we're likely to not work as hard as if we are compared to in a situation when our individual effort and work can be documented and is likely to be noted and recognized. Which means if all of our attention is not on ourself, but on our surroundings, that impacts how hard we try and the kinds of things we are paying attention to. Once we know there's some individual accountability, that in turn also affects our thoughts and behaviors, as we'll see in predictable ways. There's lots of false logic out here suggesting that opposites attract, especially one subfield of psych social psychology is attraction. What causes people not only to be romantically attracted to, but to want to be around or socialize with each other. And although opposites might attract our interest or our attention, um, they don't necessarily involve us attracting or coming toward that person. And in fact, the opposite's true we are more likely to want to talk with and be around people who are like us, demographically, religiously, um, ideologically. And so this is definitely false, even though pop psychology often says the opposite. This is interesting. Somebody is in trouble, whether stranded by the side of the road or whether they are injured, uh, for example, or sick or ill or need some help. This is true in that there's sort of a social uh, dissipation of responsibility if we were in a large group. And 
we're more likely to help someone else if we think that no one else is going to be there to take care of it themselves. Um, so when there are fewer people around, we are actually more likely to be held up for our own accountability and to do the right thing. We have a lot of examples of this in terms of our society. Democrats, Republicans, Shiites and Sunni Muslims, um, North Koreans and South Koreans, uh, all sorts of groups that conflict with each other ideologically. How do we reduce that prejudice? Well, simply putting them together doesn't work. And in fact, that can actually increase the perceived distance between what they view as reality or truth or right. So what happens, as we'll find out later, is if we can have some sort of super or larger goal that they're both working toward that will cause them to then give away their prejudices. Of course, chances are once that challenge has passed, then they will revert back to their previously prejudiced states. Here's a common belief as well, that it's better to express anger than to hold it in. And this is in fact false. The more likely we are to express anger, whether it's beating up on somebody else, whether it's just shouting as loud as we can, whether it's like in the movie The Office, breaking a bunch of printers and computers, it does not predict less aggressive behavior moving forward. In fact, it actually predicts more aggressive behavior moving forward. Also, we have a key concept here known as Dunbar's number, meaning as humans, how many other people can we keep track of? Do we view as important in our social network that we can remember certain details about them? So the logic here is that 150 plus or minus 20 or so, if I had to guess, is our average number. And notice that they're not of equal importance in terms of our social lives, which makes sense, right? Those who are central are maybe much fewer in terms of a few family members or friends that we really know a lot about and that we would really feel comfortable going with uh, or two if we wanted to talk about something important in our lives. These people will have more influence on our behavior and thoughts. And of course, then we expand out and we see that we have many more connections, but with a smaller pull or influence on us. And of course, some of these numbers have to get updated. I imagine that 130 average is probably pretty low these days, if I had to guess. Uh, but once again, if somebody that you graduated from high school with and have lost touch but see on Facebook, um, now you know is very sick, are you likely to do anything about it? Are you likely to send them flowers or make them dinner? Probably not, right? But if somebody in your very close network um, is sick, then you might be likely to do much more behaviors to try and deal with that, which goes to show that we only have so much brain space to keep track of people. And at some point when we're in large crowds, we lose sort of the ability to keep track of the individual motivations and individual qualities. And we can just see all these other people as one and the same, essentially redundant. And that can result in what we call de-individuation, um, meaning we sort of lose our internal values in that moment, uh, which can have interesting implications such as mob mentality and other things that we'll talk about. So here is one kind of social influence. Do you obey an order even if that order seems ridiculous in the time? So obedience is one form that we'll talk about. Contrast that with here there was no specific rule in this case saying you had to bring a duck but I'm sure all of us have been in a situation whether we feel we are over or underdressed, even though there were no official rules, we feel that we're sticking out. We feel that people are noticing that and judging us based on that. And this is not obedience, but instead what we're going to call conformity. Do we conform and change our behavior in terms of what we wear, how we act, what we say to fit with what the other people around us are doing? The key for us, I think, is to remember that as Americans, we often are focused internally. And when we think we're sticking out, we are much more likely to overestimate the impact that other people are noticing it because 
as Americans and individualists, we'll find out the other people are likely paying more attention to themselves as well and not having a strong antenna up for when other people are different. So let's get into some basic understanding of what social psychology is and how it works. So here we can see some of the broad scope that social psychology can involve. So we have some of the major subfields, attitudes, positive, negative, attraction as we talked about, obedience and conformity, social influence. There's also a bit of uh, cultural psychology. Um, and I think before we had a separate cultural psychology, sociocultural perspective, social psychology did a lot to add to what we know, to realize that our thoughts and behavior change based on our culture and the ways that our culture teaches us to pay attention to those around us. And it can also act as cues. So even if we're individualists or Americans, we can be cued to think in a more collectivist or holistic way. And of course, group behavior thinking, how do the decisions of groups differ from the decisions of individuals? And we can see discrimination, attitude formation, especially advertising, um, in-group, out-group formation, and of course, cultural norms. If you're meeting someone, do you extend the hand to shake or do you bow? And also social distance, right? What is a comfortable distance for having a conversation? Is it comfortable being a close talker or do you need a good bubble of distance? But let's talk into a specific aspect of social psych, our first subfield, sub-subfield, I suppose, attribution theory. Something happens, somebody behaves in our social environment, and we're trying to explain why. So that's the big question is an attribution says, here's why the person acted as they did. And our first major observation is called the fundamental attribution error. It has this very important sounding title because there's so much research to show that yes, it seems to be the case, it replicates, but most of this research shows the strongest effects for individualists. Uh, so from westernized countries such as the United States, uh, Germany, uh, Britain or England, Australia, those kinds of countries. They are most likely to make this fundamental attribution error, which is, if we are explaining why someone acted a certain way, we could go down two roads. We could take the dispositional attribution, meaning they acted that way because they always act that way. That's just who they are. It's their personality. It's their disposition. Or we could say, well, that person, I don't know anything about them. They acted this way probably just because that's the situation they found themselves in. And of course, as Americans, it's much easier to fall for the fundamental attribution error, which is to overestimate the disposition's influence. So for example, Leonard Nimoy had to write a book called I Am Not Spock because he played this character and was very popular, very notable around the country and around the world in many cases. But most people assumed that the person was the same as the actor, that the person, Leonard Nimoy, was very rational, un unsmiling, unemotional, um, but that's not, he was a normal person um, and he had his vices and problems and happinesses and uh, downs just like anybody else, right? But everybody just saw him, saw the character and thought, boom, that's just who he is. We'll also see that there are some variations to the fundamental attribution error. So just to be clear, Fundamental attribution error on its own is overestimating the importance of the disposition or personality. But we'll have some sort of corollaries to that or sub fundamental attribution errors when we break things down a little bit more. Another example with actors, if you've seen the show Monk uh, and you know who that character is, he's very neurotic, obsessive compulsive. Um, if he walks down the street, he has to touch every lamp pole. So if you saw this person, the actor who plays Monk walking down the street, if we're using the fundamental attribution error and we offer to shake his hand, maybe we would guess that he would pull back because the character Monk is a germaphobe, although there's no evidence that the actor, Tony Shalhoub, who plays him is a germaphobe too. 
Here's another example. I know I'm going way back in time. If you know who this is, good for you. If not, um, you may want to learn who Alice Cooper is. That's up to you. Um, sort of a shock rocker and known for his sort of involvement or interest in um, maybe evil or presenting uh, dramatic license with things like beheadings on stage or being put in an insane asylum. So it would surprise most people who know this as the public persona of Alice Cooper uh, to find out that in real life, um, he's actually a devout Christian and his favorite hobby, I believe, is golf. So once again, if we make the fundamental attribution error, what is this person in real life like? And we say, oh, he probably likes horror movies. He goes crazy at Halloween. We'd be wrong. And here we see some of the corollaries to the general fundamental attribution tendency. One would be, well, it matters who we're making the attribution about. So are we the actor where we know our role and we know that we are playing a role? Or are we the observer in which we are seeing somebody behave and we don't know whether they're playing a role or whether they're just that's the way they are, right? So it's easier if we are, for example, the actor, one's own behavior, we are more likely to make the external attribution, right? For example, I said something insensitive because I was just distracted. I'm not a jerk. I just look like a jerk now because I was distracted and busy, right? When it's other people though, so we are the observer of someone else's behavior, we are more likely to make the internal attribution or the dispositional attribution. That person said something insensitive, that person must be a jerk, right? This person cut me off driving, that person is a bad driver. It's not that this person might be a good driver, but is having a bad day today. We, it's much easier just to say that person did that because that's the way they are. Then we can make one final qualification. So again, there's a difference between we're the one who we're judging our own actions or we are judging somebody else's actions. When we are judging our own actions, we are likely to show evidence of this self-serving bias, meaning was the action good or bad? Did it lead to a good or bad outcome? If it's good, our self-serving bias says that we want to take credit. We want to feel good for good things that happen, sometimes take too much credit. And so the bias is that when something happens that's good, we assign an internal locus of causality or we make the dispositional personality attribution, meaning I donated to charity today because I'm a good person, right? It's not that I donated to charity because uh, the person was begging me for money and I just gave in this time. Now contrast that if the outcome is bad. So in this case, I remember uh, when I was in college and I was driving in the back roads in Northwest Ohio and I lost control of my car, took out a telephone pole, uh, totaled my car. Now, what would I do? Do I think I'm a terrible driver and I should just never drive? No, I don't make the internal attribution. I do the external. I say, well, look, I, I understand that, you know, maybe I should have had more control, but I cross county lines. And once I cross county lines, they hadn't plowed. And so that's why I lost control. It wasn't my fault. It was something about the situation. Of course, the officer cited me for failure to control my vehicle. So I was the only person making this external uh, self-serving bias. Everybody else saw right, right through it. Um, but that's the key. When we're making the self-serving bias, we really don't realize we're doing it to serve our ego. And sometimes it's hard for us to see when we're sort of going overboard and not taking blame for something or responsibility for something that we should. And of course, maybe the best example of this attributional thinking involved driving because when we're driving, we usually don't think we know the other drivers around us. They're just other people in cars and we're judging their behavior in many cases, poor driving, whether or not using a blinker, or in this case, whether maybe cutting you off 
we could make the situational attribution we can see the concerned eyes that represent once we make that attribution our behavior and our emotions and that we say that person is ill maybe that person you know is is distracted and they're having a bad day so let's just take it easy on them right and then our behavior is once we've made that attribution uh, that it's external well let's not be a jerk let's just calm down and let them take care of it as they need to but of course that's not what we do right fundamental attribution error says we see a behavior and we want to make the internal dispositional attribution that person's a bad driver causes us to have the angry emotional reaction and then we can have our maybe potentially dangerous or retaliatory behavior such as trying to cut them off or tailgating them or honking at them or making gestures any number of things because we've made the attribution that that person is a terrible driver that person should have their license taken away and somebody needs to do something about it so hopefully now that we know a little bit more about the fundamental attribution error maybe we'll be less likely to make it in some cases or at least be able to take a step back pause and maybe try and think if the our initial attribution our gut attribution is really correct in that circumstance another example of our thoughts and our feelings would be this is called uh, embodied cognition so the position of our body and our facial features can also impact whether we're happy whether we're not happy um, whether we feel like we're interested or not interested so for example in this case we see you're watching a video and you're instructed to keep the pen between your lips and not touching your teeth Contrast that with this facial position in which you are told to watch the same video with the pen between your teeth but and your lips not touching the pen. And of course, you might be able to guess that this facial position, uh, is particularly the movement of and position of the facial muscles, mouth muscles, are muscles that we move when we smile, when we have genuine smiles. And so that influences our cognition such that we tend to evaluate more positively things that we see when we have this facial position compared to the previous slide. And then we go back to attribution. Well, why did you like this thing? You know, some people will say, well, I guess it has something to do with the pen. But on average, we underestimate how much the pen influenced our judgments. And we may overestimate things about well I like this video better because you know I like this product better I like the colors or the music right we add other things that we think guided our judgment when in reality um, we underestimate this very simple thing the position of our facial muscles another example would be what do you see here describe what this is and if you for example describe the central features I see three fish I see one that seems to be biggest and I see a few things in the background such as the frog and a snail you would be providing the classic individualist explanation of this because individualists are what we call central processors we focus on the most important thing and we are through our socialization are more likely to disregard and not even see or be influenced by things in the background contrast that with somebody who is a collectivist who was raised in a collectivist society China being the best example uh, Japan India would be others as well you are trained instead to think less centrally and more holistically so instead of seeing the individual pieces and ranking the ones that stick out versus the ones that don't you are seeing this as a general scene and so you would see a stream or an ocean or a pond and that would be your first way to describe this another example of how collectivists and individualists might appraise certain things differently evaluate how happy this character is on a scale of 1 to 10 individualists would probably say he looks very happy and I would guess that he's a 9 or a 10 because as central processors we can pick out this individual person and then we can just 
imagine what it's like to be him and essentially ignore the other people in the picture. Now, it might seem strange, but on average, collectivists will rate this person as less happy, you know, maybe a six or seven or eight. Why? Because for a collectivist, it is hard to be a 10 in happy when the people around you aren't also a 10. And so there you can see some examples that a collective culture will by extension have more social influence from the people around. You are less, first of all, less wanting to stand out because you know other people are paying more attention to you and other people are paying more attention to you as well. And so if you try to stand out less, that would be uh, important and adaptive social behavior for that environment because that's what the environment expects out of you. Now contrast that previous example, which talked about being raised as a sort of dispositional collectivist or individualist. Now you can say somebody as an adult has been raised in a collectivist or individualistic society. Are they trained uh, to, for every situation, to just see things individually or collectively? Well, research also shows no, that even if you're a collectivist, prototypical American, you can be primed through symbols uh, that represent or are associated with collectivist thinking to in that situation, when you've got a collectivist mindset primed, to think a little bit more collectively. Of course, you're not gonna change from an individualist to a collectivist, but you can be nudged. And I think that's what's important for us is that when we go on to talk about personality, personality isn't set in concrete what you are and you can't change it. It's true you can't totally change it, but you can be nudged in certain situations, and we have to find out what are important ways to do that nudging. Let's move into the issue of attraction in social psychology. So basically, it's interpersonal attraction, and it can be romantic and even sexual attraction. So first of all, we have the physical attractiveness stereotype. Essentially, people who are physically attractive um, are seen as having better attributes. They're seen as smarter. They're seen as more outgoing. They're seen, they're seen as more mentally stable. And you can see actors such as Brad and Matt McConaughey. Um, I think we would probably overestimate, based on the physical attractiveness stereotype, how intelligent, how sociable, um, and how capable they are in general. Now we also have physical attraction in terms of matching, right? So a classic relationship in the past, in the 80s, was model Cindy Crawford with uh, Lyle Lovett, musician. And you can see, it seems like they don't really match, um, but maybe, um, I don't know much detail about them, even though physically uh, we would maybe attribute the attractive one to be a little smarter, a little more outgoing, a little more mentally stable. Um, maybe they did match on a lot of other things, such as intelligence and religious beliefs and so forth. And of course, part of physical attractiveness is, hard, is how you dress. Um, and so, for example, if somebody is wearing um, maybe sort of party clothes or if in class, you know, wearing sweats, for example, we might see them as less physically attractive in that moment and then make these corresponding um, judgments about them. So in some ways, we're born with the level of attractiveness that we have. Um, and we, we can't transform from a two to a 10. What we can do is other things, um, such as how we dress um, and how we take care of our physical appearance in the way that is reasonable, um, so that we can, in some ways, manage the attributes that people uh, will give to us. We also have the idea of the matching similarity hypothesis. It's also called uh, homophily, which is essentially that we want to be around people who are similar to us. And of course, we can think about it in terms of uh, demographics, such as, you know, do white people want to be around white people and black people want to be around black people? Uh, yes, to some extent, that's true, but it's not just those. Um, it's also people who share our attitudes. Um, so, for example, this is 
a big time for applying this to uh, social media and Facebook and Instagram and Reddit. So where do you read about politics? Where do you get other people's um, takes and um, explanations of things that are going on in the world? Well, chances are, if you are a Democrat, you're more likely to seek out CNN and you're uh, likely to go on the CNN discussion boards. And if you're a uh, conservative, more likely perhaps to go to Fox News or other outlets. And so what happens is we seek out people who are similar to us, and then we have our attitudes and beliefs echoed back to us from those similar people. And if we look at this playing out in society, it can be very problematic because then you just have people further distancing themselves um, from other people in society um, who they should have to get along with, um, but maybe don't really interact with very much. And so you have some remedies to that. Uh, many organizations value diversity, um, and we have laws such as affirmative action to sort of counteract the natural tendency for humans to want to do this. Also, we have the idea of reciprocity. If you've heard of the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's the basic idea. If you behave well, then other people will see that, oh, somebody's been nice to me. I want to be nice to that person. Now, how does this work in terms of child development? Well, think about, for example, authoritative parents who balance rewards and punishments also with explaining why they think this way and why it's important to do this or that. Well, at first, the child is going to respond mostly to the reward, rewards or punishers, right? I don't swear because I get in trouble for it. I've been told it's a bad word and mom and dad don't like it when I use it. But after they hear the explanation why you don't use this word because it might be insulting to other people or it might be offensive and we don't value that, uh, we want to respect other people with the way we talk. And as the child develops, the motivation for not swearing changes from avoiding punishment to this is a part of who I am and this is an important value that I want to show in the world and hopefully have that reciprocated back to me. Now, of course, the problem is with our current political environment is that this can work the exact opposite too. Somebody throws out an insult, oftentimes the president, and what do you do? Most times the initial insult or the initial uh, response is to reciprocate that insult, call that person a bad name back, who then reciprocates, and then you have a negative feedback cycle that takes the discussion down into the gutter. So I think it's important for us to remember that reciprocity is a real thing. Um, even people who we would make an attribution as bad people um, will often reciprocate good behavior toward them. Um, so in some of the, in some ways, you know, this is a, a big belief in the Christian faith, and I imagine others as well. Um, be the light that you want to see in the world. And there's research to support that, fortunately. Another example would be um, if, for example, I want to encourage my son to play a sport. He starts playing tennis and he's pretty bad at it, but maybe I'll give him a compliment, right? I like how you really tried. I like how you got a little bit better this time. And maybe he internalizes that and how he reciprocates that would be trying harder and getting better. So in fact, you've taken something through a compliment that may not represent reality, but through rep reciprocity, um, the way that that changes the other person's attitude and behavior might cause them to actually start being good at that sport or at cooking, for example. Um, so not surprisingly, high quality marriages will have a high degree of positive reciprocity, right? They don't start insulting each other and negatively spiral down. They have each negative comment usually um, supported by nine or 10 positive comments so that generally reciprocity works in a positive way to make the marriage stronger. Following up on the previous notion that opposites don't actually attract, we have what was in the 80s and 90s, a big movement, a book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, essentially saying that men and women 
uh, interpret their environment and communicate things so differently that they're essentially speaking different languages. And if you've ever had a fight with a significant other, it might feel that way. But of course, we underestimate that, in fact, we were attracted to each other, research supports, that in most cases because we had a lot of things in common. And of course, if men were from Mars and women were from Venus, we would view each other as alien and almost no one ever would, would get married because of that. So again, in the moment, we can underestimate our similarities, even though it feels like in that moment we're not connecting. Let's talk about another uh, very impactful aspect of social psychology. This would be the topic of cognitive dissonance. And this one is a little tricky to follow first off. Uh, but I think if we really look at a lot of the things that we've spent a lot of time on in our lives, we might be able to see some evidence of cognitive dissonance. If you want to think about it at its basic level, it's the idea of hypocrisy, that humans don't want to be hypocrites, and that if our attitudes and our behavior do not match, it creates a dissonant state, sort of like listening to an instrument that's out of tune. Your brain just can't deal with it and it needs to resolve this dissonance somehow. So how did Festinger, a uh, long time ago, over 60 years ago, discover this? Well, he came up with a task, a peg turning task that was very boring. And so the instructions were, okay, turn every peg a quarter turn to the left. Then the person goes through. Okay, now I want you to turn them a halfway around. Goes through and does it again. A few times through, you're thinking, what's the point of this? And also that this is not fun, right? So here's how they create the dissonance. Essentially, they are asking someone to lie, to say, okay, thank you for your time doing this task. We know it wasn't super fun, but can you then tell the next person up that you actually kind of liked it and that they should come on in and look forward to doing this. So what's the manipulation? Well, what is the incentive to lie? So for example, one group was paid $20 to lie, which in 1950s money was pretty big. The other group was paid $1 to lie. So not much uh, to justify being a hypocrite or telling a lie. So what happens then? The person gets paid, or they, they tell the lie, and then they have to get their money. And as the, the final thing, the researcher says, okay, we know it wasn't a super fun task, um, but and you just told that other person, the, the next poor sucker up, that it wasn't bad. Just be brutally honest. How much did you like that task? And look what happens here. You would think that perhaps the people paid 20 to lie would say, well, I loved it. But in fact, they had cognitive dissonance saying, okay, I'm telling a lie, but I don't think I'm a lying person. I'm not always a liar, but I resolved my dissonance by saying essentially 20 bucks was enough to justify this one inconsistent or hypocritical behavior. And so then they can be bluntly honest and say, no, I hated that task. It was super boring. What happens with those without sufficient justification? They told a lie and it wasn't a big enough reward for them to say, well, I told a lie, I'm a hypocrite, but that's okay. I did it for a dollar. And in fact, that incentive isn't enough to justify the cognitive dissonance, so they do the only thing that they can do. Their attitudes and behavior are out of line. You can't change your previous attitude. What you can do is bring your current, or you can't change your previous behavior, but you can bring your current attitude in line with that, right? So I did this boring task and I lied and said it was not boring. You know what? It actually wasn't boring. And so my lie is not hypocritical because the task wasn't that boring. So once again, you can see the basic breakdown and who reported liking the task more. It was the group that was offered insufficient justification or reward the payment wasn't enough to justify the lie or the hypocrisy. And so what do they do? They change their previous, they change their current attitude from what their previous attitude was so that their new attitude matches their past behavior.
So that was a complicated setup for the cognitive dissonance experiment. How is it important? How do we see it play out? Well, we have some conditions under which cognitive dissonance is most likely to occur. And the key is, unlike the experiment, when it plays out in our lives, it's usually over a long period of time. It's where we maybe don't have sufficient justification to resolve it, so we have to change our attitudes. We freely chose to start doing that thing. Um, we had other options, and we are heavily invested, usually in terms of spending a lot of time on it. So many cults, for example, seem to have uh, evidence of cognitive dissonance. This is the Heaven's Gate cult, where the people ultimately drank the Kool-Aid uh, that caused their mass suicide, thinking that they would be uh, redeemed in some way by leaving Earth. What caused these people to join this cult? Did they join the cult thinking, okay, I'm starting today and in a year I'm going to commit suicide? No. These weren't people who had major psychological disorders. Um, instead, these were normal people who just started down a pathway and as they were asked to do more things, they experienced more cognitive dissonance. And you have two choices, just leave, right? Which seems to be the rational one. But if you make that rational choice, you also have to say, wow, I was stupid for ever starting this thing. And many people don't go down that road. So instead, instead of calling themselves stupid, they resolve the con cognitive dissonance by doubling down, getting more involved. And th as things escalate, the cognitive dissonance only grows. And people ask themselves, well, what am I doing here? Well, it's because there's gotta be something important. I haven't just wasted all this time. There's a reason for this. Uh, Scientology, the Church of Scientology is another example. It starts slow, um, but they have you take more classes, spend more money on educational materials. And so maybe you're starting with 500 bucks a year. That increases to a couple thousand, um, 10,000 to 50,000. And you have people spending most of the money they make just for educational materials in the Church of Scientology. And of course, if you could step back and be a rational person, you would say, oh, that's dumb, I gotta stop now. But most people instead, um, through cognitive dissonance, will have to change their attitudes and say, you know what, I really, I have to have faith. This is really worthwhile, this is what I wanna do, this is what I'm meant to do. Another example would be, if you've heard of Stockholm Syndrome, captors eventually showing positive feelings toward their uh, kidnappers. This is the story of J.C. Dugard and the Garritos who kidnapped her when she was very young. Um, they kept her locked in the backyard in a shed. They forcibly raped her and she had multiple children. You would think if anyone does that to me, I would hate them and I would just be biding my time so I could get away and make them suffer for what they've done. But cognitive distance doesn't really show that. So in JC's case, um, the seeds for cognitive dissonance were sown by the Garritos eventually giving her some choices. So for example, they said you can't go by your that name anymore, but you can choose what name you wanna have now. Um, also, would you like to come in and maybe have dinner, uh, you and your children? Oh, that's good, thank you. And then we'll let you have maybe even more house time moving forward. And so what was interesting was it seemed to be that the captors were so convinced uh, that she was brainwashed that they, for example, let her stay in the house eventually. Um, and he was a for, he was former um, uh, parolee. So he had a parole officer coming to the house, uh, I think hundreds of times over the course of, you know, a couple decades. And there are plenty of times for JC to have said to the parole officer, look, I'm JC Dugard, I've been abducted, you need to save me, you know, but she didn't because, you know, she was had cognitive dissonance. She thought they're not so bad. They're taking care of my kids. You know, life could be worse. And the way they got caught was uh, Philip Garrido had such a superiority complex that he thought his version of Christianity and religion had to be shared with the rest of the world. So he started going to college campuses and taking JC and her daughters. And some of the people at these campuses said something is wrong about this relationship. It's weird. Um, and so they brought in the law enforcement. And even when law enforcement came to the house, JC still would not say that she was indeed JC Dugard and was captured and kidnapped. 
So what had to happen was bring them all to the police office and at the station, separate JC from the rest of her family. And even then, we think we know who you are. Will you just tell us your name? And she would not tell us her, her born name. The only way that they could get for her to release it was to eventually write it down. And once that happened, it seemed like she made then the decision to break the cognitive dissonance. But I think now we can see when you've got 20 years of your life and your family involved, the cognitive, cognitive dissonance is so strong that what seems rational and common sense to us is anything but to the person experiencing it. But now for a less distressing example, think about your job, think about your school, think about your hobbies, think about things that you've been spending a lot of time on, right? Has this been beneficial? Has it been worthwhile? And I think we all know somebody who's in a dead end job, right? They could do more, they could make more, they could get in a job that would offer a better chance for promotion, but they don't search, right? So they're in a dead end job, does that person then feel like, well, I'm a loser, this is what I deserve? No, cognitive dissonance would lead them to then change their attitude and say, well, you know, I see there's some things that could be better, but actually I love this job, right? I think about maybe the, the amount of time I've spent watching college football, right? In the situation, I'd realize, wow, I've spent too much time on this. It feels like, you know, I'm not getting much out of this, but cognitive dissonance would say, well, you know, I really like it and it's a good thing to talk about. I'm going to keep watching it. And only recently have I been able to sort of break this and say, look, I'm not enjoying it much. It's kind of wasting my time in some ways. Let's just watch the Buckeyes and the Big Ten football and that'll be good enough for me. Let's move into another common aspect of social psychology. This would be the influence that our social role has on our thoughts and behavior. And of course, anytime we are behaving and thinking in the world, it's usually a, con a confluence or a combination of who we are, our personality, and how we generally think and act, and also the external pressures that we're facing in that specific situation. What is the situation's strength? And of course, when we're in a role, the situation's strength is stronger, right? If we're in, for example, a customer service position, we probably are acting nicer then we act outside of that role, right? And oftentimes we underestimate the influence of a role when we're making attribution, right? So we, as again, as individualists are more likely to make the fundamental attribution error and say, why did that policeman pull us over and write us a ticket? The internal fundamental attribution error would be that cop is just a jerk. That cop is on a power trip, right? The external attribution, which we're not likely to make, but probably more accurate was, this person's just doing his job and it has nothing to do whether he's nice or a jerk. Uh, also, you can see Halloween, you see spikes of aggressive behavior and vandalism and violence. And that has to do with a lot of people dressing up in costumes um, and acting in accordance with the role of their costume. And perhaps the most famous study involving the powerful effects of roles is the Zimbardo prison study. So Phil Zimbardo was a faculty member in the psychology department at Stanford uh, in the 70s. And he set up this, what was to be a two week study. And he wanted to look at the effect of simply assigning people the role of a prisoner or a prison guard. And he basically reworked a whole floor of one of the Stanford academic buildings into a makeshift prison. Uh, so spent a decent amount of money uh, and he worked with the local police department to say, those who were randomly assigned to be the prisoners, they were actually picked up from their places of residence in a police car and handcuffed and then taken uh, to the campus to play the role of a prisoner. Those who were prisoners had to stay there for the whole two weeks. Uh, those who were prison guards got to work their shift and then go outside and live their normal life. Now what happened was the study couldn't even get to two weeks long because Although the roles were basically you as a prison guard have to do very minimal things. You have to take role, make sure the people are there. Um, what happened was the prison guards added things to their assigned directions 
to their role that they had probably learned elsewhere in society from movies, from their own lives. And so basically added other things beyond what they were told to do uh, into their role. And so they would come up with ways to, in some ways, torture uh, or at least light torture the prisoners. Um, they would do emotional abuse, calling them names, forcing them to act out or act as uh, people of the other gender. Um, they would go excessively with punishments, uh, removing toilet privileges, for example, uh, making them do physical exercise as a result of punishment for simple things, um, not following orders that the prison guards weren't told to give in the first place. And things were getting so bad that Unfortunately, Zimbardo couldn't see it because ironically, in his uh, experiment on the impact of roles, he gave himself a role to be biased, which was the prison warden. Um, so in fact, uh, his girlfriend at the time uh, basically told him when he was describing what was happening, look, you have to call this off. Things are much worse than you realize. Uh, and in fact, they called it off uh, after about a week. Uh, because fortunately they didn't have a lawsuit, uh, but they certainly opened themselves up to one. And this also has shown instructively that um, if you think that a study you're doing could lead to some psychological trauma, first of all, you have to have a justifiable reason to do it. Um, and then you also have to give informed consent to the participants, right? Uh, and so chances are, if you sign up for a psychology study, it will have to be reviewed multiple times. And if there is any danger, you will be well aware of any potential danger. The importance of Zimbardo's study on roles though, uh, he, I've seen him in a talk at the University of Akron uh, about a decade ago, and he still is talking about how this plays out in our lives. If you remember the Iraq war, um, the Abu Ghraib prison, and you had many uh, soldiers who were essentially torturing uh, captives. And the irony was that that prison was used previously by Saddam Hussein to torture dissidents uh, in Iraq. Why were the Americans doing the same thing? It caused a huge uh, national, international uproar. And of course there was initially a witch hunt. We need to find out who the bosses were and fire them. Fire these people, they're sick, they don't represent the U.S. military. But Zimbardo was saying, you got it wrong, right? You've created a situation that you gave people roles and you didn't give them enough specific orders so that they had to fill out the roles themselves, right? And the, the idea is that these people who are torturing captors, prisoners of war, were not sick or psychologically disturbed. In fact, that could be you, me, or anybody else if we were put in that situation. Uh, and so that would be Zimbardo's message uh, for anybody who wants to learn more about his famous study. We also have, moving beyond just roles, what would be how much we are paying attention to our situation and how does our behavior change in response to that? Uh, so conformity represents that. We don't want to stick out. We notice when we're different. And I love this motivational poster. When people are free to do as they please, they usually imitate each other. Uh, and that's true to some extent. Um, so think about if you walk into maybe a waiting room um, and everybody's taking a nap, chances are you're probably going to be more likely to take a nap. Instead, if everybody's on their phone, chances are you whip your phone out, right? Uh, you know, I'm not uh, Muslim, but if I went to the Hajj, right, uh, if I just was teleported there instantly and I had to sort of decide how I was going to behave, I would probably start walking around just like everybody else was because I wouldn't want to stick out. So Solomon Ash came up with one of the initial studies to test conformity, and he came up with a task in which everybody with normal vision could get the right answer. So of course, given this line, which of these three lines is the right answer? And everybody, when giving the answer by themselves, gives the correct answer. So what did Ash do? Well, essentially, he did this in group settings so that everybody had to go around one by one and say what they thought the right answer was. The key was everybody in the room except the one person who was an actual participant was a stooge. Um, they were a Confederate, they were in on it. 
Uh, and so you know, people would go around the room and the first few trials, everything would seem normal. And then maybe the third or fourth trial, the first person would say what you thought was the wrong answer. Then the next person would agree. And then it comes to you to say whether you think uh, your right answer is the right answer. Would you say what you view as objective truth or would you conform and give an answer that you think is false? In fact, uh, about a third of people would conform and give a wrong answer um, in the course of the experiment. And I think we see this oftentimes again in our politics, right? There are many people who've been uh, at working as politicians for a long time and they know generally what's a good or bad policy, the effect of a, a new decision. Um, but oftentimes, if other people in the party are saying what they know to be wrong, they'll often conform, right? And so I think we see this playing out many times, not just micro in our own social life, uh, but also macro in our larger political context. So of course, continuing the political example, um, you know, one time, once you've committed to a goal, um, will you, if you have uh, contrasting or contradicting information, change your mind, or will you just stay resolute that I don't want to be a flip-flopper and I'm going to conform to everybody else, even if it means uh, jumping off the proverbial cliff with them. And then we per have perhaps the most famous uh, social psychology experiment. And this is moving on much further than the influence of roles or conformity. And in fact, we're talking about obedience. So this is creating as strong of a situation as about as you can imagine, and then asking someone to do something bad. Uh, so Stanley Milgram was the researcher at Yale University who came up with this in the 60s. Um, and there's been lots of uh, additions to this, for example, uh, this is the real life uh, example where somebody was a prankster but uh, ordered a manager to fire an employee um, and he kept that that manager on the line um, and made up lies saying I've, I've been in touch with corporate I, I know that person uh, this employee has stolen um, and in fact got it so far that the person um, manager actually checked that employee's purse um, just because she was told to do so um, other examples, you know, ordering nurses to change meds, pretending to be a certain doctor. I don't know who you are. Well, I'm Dr. So-and-so. You need to do it now or your patient's going to be in serious jeopardy. Um, I don't know the numbers of who actually obeyed, but it was more than zero, which is scary. So this seems like a, a fairly, I guess, desperate way to test people um, looking at the capacity for evil. Um, but you have to consider it in the backdrop of World War II, uh, the Nuremberg trials were happening. So they had rounded up Nazi officers and were asked, how could you commit such terrible crimes? And the world seemed to be shocked that the answer was often, I'm not a monster. It's not that. It was, I was just following orders, right? That's what I was told to do. And there were going to be dire consequences if I didn't. So um, I ordered these people to be killed. I ordered those people to be uh, killed chemically, for example. So Milgram uh, wanted to challenge the common assumption that there was something inherently evil about the Nazis themselves, and instead wanted to say, look, I think there's a situation where normal people, you and I, could be put in such a dire situation, and we could actually obey terrible orders too, if the situational pressure is strong enough. So here's his basic setup. You have this shock box, uh, and it has a row of shock levels. And then you have this one, and if somebody was to play the teacher who was going to deliver the shocks, the learner, um, on the other hand, the teacher would give some word pairings, and the learner would have to give the right answer. For each wrong answer, they'd have to give a shock. For each subsequent wrong answer, they'd have to give an increasingly high shock. right? And then there was the experimenter in the room monitoring uh, the, the teacher to make sure that they were following the instructions. So here you see the ad for the setup. Um, $4, so going back to Festinger, probably not enough for cognitive dissonance um, justification. So you can't say, well, 
you know, I delivered some painful shocks to someone, but it's okay because I got paid enough. Um, that's probably not going to be uh, enough to justify maybe some of the psychological consequences that those teachers had after uh, finishing up with the study. And notice there's nothing about shocks in the, uh, the advertisement. It's just a study of memory, right? This doesn't sound bad. Um, sounds very much on the up and up so far, right? And it's also clearly associated with Yale University. I wouldn't think that I'm going to go there and participate in any study exploring the depths of human capacity for evil, for example. Now, as you've probably figured out or have already read in the book, um, the teacher was not actually delivering shocks. Um, in fact, the learner was an actor who was not getting shocked, but um, had played a script um, to look like they were. Um, and just to show that they weren't messing around, this shock box could actually deliver one shock. So the lowest level of shock was actually administered to the teacher, which, as we'll find out, was a fairly painful level. So right from the start, you realize that this is no joke. If this is where we're starting with the shock level, I really have the expectation that moving up will injure uh, this learner in the next room. This is one of the cool pieces of psychology history. Um, I've actually seen this at the Psychology Archives um, in Akron. So if you're ever interested, you can go to the National Archives of Psychology in nearby Akron, Ohio, and see some of these cool examples of psychology's history. So the shock box was huge uh, in real life, very intimidating. And it had, as, as you can see, uh, a very high number of escalating potential shocks going all the way up to the dubious XXX. Here you can see uh, essentially the script. So once again, the, the learner was not actually getting shocked, uh, but you know, 120 volts, uh, I think that's similar to basic what you'd get from your wall outlet at home. So you're starting with pain, then you introduce heart trouble first, then you introduce, I want to get out of here, demanding to get out, right? Um, then sort of uh, becoming sort of non-coherent with increasingly agonized screams, and now I'm done. I refuse to continue, right? Um, so you can see now it's building up to essentially hysteria, right? The, the teacher is really believing that they're causing uh, pain physically and psychologically to the learner. So of course, the big question would be, how many people how many teachers, participants, delivered the full XXX maximum shock? And what we see here is that the answer is shocking. Two thirds of people, um, and many of which would say during the course of the experiment, look, this isn't right. I don't wanna do this. I, I can't keep going. This person doesn't deserve to be in pain. But the experimenter was in the room saying, you must continue giving the orders for obedience. Here's what you have to do. I'm telling you to do it. And even though they didn't want to, and they tried to get out of it, the majority, two thirds of the teachers gave this maximum XXX shock. Perhaps the most interesting part to me would be before actually getting the data and running the study, Milgram uh, sent out a poll to leading uh, philosophers and psychologists and sociologists in human behavior and asked what percentage now that you know what I'm trying to do, would go all the way to this maximum shock. And the experts believe that, you know, maybe only one or two percent of the population would go. And clearly the experts underestimated the power of the situation, which is a recurring theme uh, for our slideshow today. And as common in social psychology, you start with the baseline study here's the maximum pressure that Milgram could exert. Now, how about you reduce some of this social pressure? Um, so for example, if you're free to choose the shock level, here now where you, is where you get to the expert predictions, the sadists and masochists in the population. Well, if you had the free choice of the shocks, not surprisingly, very few people would choose to do that. Um, of course, some of these others, if you, instead of just pressing buttons from a separate room, now you're actually forcing that person's down, hand down on a shock plate. 
um, simply even putting them in the same room um, redu reduces the levels of obedience by nearly half. And of course, if you, for example, are walking in and you see uh, some people leaving and yelling and saying how terrible this was, um, chances are once you've seen one other person uh, rebel, uh, your level of obedience goes way down. In the same case, I meant to say before, with the Ash line study of conformity, if you just have one other person who gives what you think is the right answer, you're much less likely to conform. So of course, many action movies are based on a simple premise. Um, your daughter or son has been kidnapped and you need to do this, this, and this, or you will lose your loved one. Um, will you obey my orders? Um, so of course it makes for a good movie plot, but of course you can see when the situation is strong enough, you can get good people to do bad things. Now we continue our exploration of different aspects of social psychology, less from the impact of roles and orders and conformity into what are the constitution of your social influence? What are the people around you doing uh, in terms of influencing your own thoughts and behavior? One classic example we've already touched on a bit would be deindividuation. So those situations that are strong enough, uh, such as combat, uh, where people would find themselves uh, engaging in behavior, uh, maybe uh, yelling or violence uh, toward other people that previously they would have thought they wouldn't do, right? But in that moment, um, you're behaving in accordance with the people's behavior around you, right? Um, so for example, this can also happen at uh, large events like concerts um, and football games, for example. Um, also mobs. Um, we've had uh, riots break out in the country recently, and good people who otherwise aren't trying to break windows of cars and stores or throw things um, at fellow human beings, um, in that moment felt deindividuated individuated uh, because of the strong emotional uh, ties of the moment, caused themselves to lose track in some ways of what they normally would and would not do. Now, in some cases, de-individuation can help. Social facilitation for a well-learned skill, for example, playing music or playing sports, can actually cause an improved performance. So you're less paying attention to yourself and judging yourself and more getting caught up in the moment and the crowd's enjoyment. Of course, this only works, social facilitation, when that skill is well-learned. Of course, if you're trying to do something in front of a crowd that you are still learning, um, so you're not a very good guitar player, for example, and now you're in front of a huge crowd, chances are the opposite of social facilitation would happen and your performance would get worse. Just like having to, de to deliver a presentation if you're not well prepared for it. We also have the notion of groupthink. So this is where, similar to conformity, um, basically the desire to not stick out cause you to not say what you truly feel. We have two sort of subtypes of this group think. One would be group polarization. That means that, for example, Democrats and Republicans start with sort of different issues on, for example, health care or gun regulation. And then as they discuss it, we find out that after the discussion, their opinions have polarized so that those in the middle have moved toward the extremes. We also have the idea of risky shift essentially that group decisions can often be more risky than the individual. And that's because of this diffusion of responsibility. You know, if you're going to, as a president, declare war on another country, um, that will be blamed on you. Uh, on the other hand, if it is a group of people, for example, um, you can have some of that negative consequence later to come, potential negative consequence, uh, diffused so you're not sharing the whole blame. Um, and in that case, you may be more likely to make a risky decision. Here we can see how group polarization plays out, right? Um, so again, let's say there's a relatively even spread for, do we have fully socialized medicine or do we remove any public funding for healthcare and medicine? 
And then we see a lot of people who are toward the middle. But after discussing it, instead of coming to a consensus one way or the other, now we've actually polarized and are further away from a solution than we were further. And essentially, we've, we've removed the moderates. And I think that's clearly what we're seeing in our political environment today. And what can cause this to be reduced? Well, chances are it takes a serious event for us to sort of realize that we're all Americans, Republicans and Democrats. Um, hopefully it doesn't take the fall of the healthcare system for that to happen, um, but it might. Um, because if the healthcare system uh, gets so expensive that nobody's getting quality healthcare anymore, um, then of course, then we'd have to put our temporary differences aside to solve this greater problem that we're all accountable for. As we wrap up our discussion of social psychology, I think it's important to put things in perspective. Basically, we've talked about the different effect that ways to increase the situation of force can have on people. But I think what's sort of encouraging for us is that as individuals, even in the very, very strongest situations imaginable, it doesn't completely overwhelm everybody. Uh, and this is a picture of the tank man from Tiananmen Square in China. The backstory is that there was a protest that started and it mushroomed and ballooned into large scale riots and uh, demands for uh, equality, for individual rights, for government accountability. And as it got bigger and bigger, the socialist government of China does not like any sort of displays of strong individuality. Um, it's against its own interest and the cultural interest. And so the military came in to put down this protest and put an end to it. And that was successful in large part. And here we see the aftermath where this uh, line of tanks was rolling down the street and one individual decided to stand up to them. And this was a big symbol for individual expression in what is not expected. Uh, and in fact, routinely punished heavily uh, in a communist socialist China. And so of course, what happened to the tank man? Did he get run over? Um, in fact, no, he didn't. The tanks tried to drive around him. He kept moving in front of them. Um, and so they were so unprepared for this, they had to sort of call it in and discuss, here's the situation, what are we supposed to do? Um, so in the meantime, some other people came and whisked tank man away, and we've never really heard from him again. Uh, we think that he was probably taken to a work camp and probably will spend the rest of his life there. Um, but we don't know for sure. But what's interesting is that, of course, the government did not want to have evidence of individual expression such as this and resistance to the government and military. And so the hotel rooms around were swept uh, for pictures and any video of this. Uh, and so the person who took this picture uh, knew that the, the government did not want this picture to exist. So he took the film, put it in a waterproof case and threw it in the toilet uh, a few minutes later. The military was there to search his room, fortunately missed the toilet, and we have this evidence of the strongest situation perhaps imaginable um, in which we still see um, some individual expression. But to have a more positive spin on things, right? Uh, so again, manage the worst, imagine the worst situation. Um, people aren't fully controllable through the situation. Um, they can be heavily influenced, you can get most of them to obey, but oftentimes you can't get everybody to do exactly the same thing. Let's review a bit. So, students did poorly, the professor is making an attribution about the class. Fundamental attribution error would say the professor is more likely to make a dispositional or personality attribution. The students were unmotivated. Now, of course, if the students were making this attribution error, they did poorly on the test, self-serving bias would say that they would look for an external or situational attribution. Um, they're not going to say that internally I'm just terrible at math. They would instead say uh, it was something else about the situation that caused me to just have a bad result this one time. Both Milgram and Zimbardo ask participants um, to play a role. Uh, of course, Milgram went further and then gave them specific orders to obey.
and to be gender neutral or gender equal, um, it could be about how dumb men are either way. Somebody says a joke, everybody's laughing, you think it's offensive, but you don't say anything, maybe even crack a smile. What are you doing here? This would be conformity. Uh, of course, if someone said, okay, either smile or we're going to kick you out of the house, then that's not conformity. Now you're given uh, a, an order. Do you obey or not obey? Let's do a quick true false. This is false. Dress for success is important. Any way that we can uh, improve general perceptions of our physical attractiveness, even as um, unimportant as it may seem, it does influence people's attributions about us. This is also true. Uh, even years later, 10 years later, they've interviewed some people from Zimbardo's study and the prisoners, especially in that environment, they didn't have a name. They just had a prison number. And a decade later, they still remembered the prison number they were given, which shows that they were very de-individuated in that moment. This is false. Uh, making attributions according to the self-serving bias is healthy uh, to a reasonable extent. Of course, somebody could um, think they're God's gift to the world and never take any blame um, for the stuff that they do that's wrong. And of course, that's delusional and not psychologically healthy. But a little bit of this is good um, because if we didn't try to boost our ego, we would all be much more depressed. When we look at altruistic behavior, it may th we may think that, you know, there are just people like Mother Teresa who are just good people and they always do good. And it's true, there are some cases and some examples where it is internal morality that predicts altruistic behavior. But much more often, the true predictor is the situation. People do nice things because it's convenient or because they're asked to do it. If we look at the Zimbardo and the Milgram experiments, uh, historically we view them as unethical. Um, not because they shouldn't have ever been done, but because now we have much better standards of reviewing research, um, making sure more people look at it before it's going to be done uh, to decide whether they have permission, and also giving informed consent, making sure that there is, if there is some sort of psychological or physical trauma, that you know ahead of time what's going to be involved. So this is false, though. Um, most social psychologists today uh, don't actually do... Uh, Milgram type research because partly it's it's difficult it's hard to get approval for that and you have to justify that what you learn is worth the potential harm um, and in fact much research in social psychology is fairly benign just like other aspects in other areas of psychology and academia in general and once again through social psychology we see weird behavior and instead of making the internal attribution that crazy people do crazy things like join crazy cults. Instead, it's because of the slow process of cognitive dissonance that takes fairly rational, fairly normal, psychologically healthy people um, to ultimately do some things that we would judge as crazy. And let's look at our key study. We have one of the most famous and most interesting current social psychologist, Roy Baumeister, uh, formerly of Case Western in Ohio, uh, now at Florida State, I believe. He looked at this idea of ego depletion, sort of a Freudian view that we only have so much energy for our ego to regulate our behavior. And at any time we have to show volition or self-regulation, we have to make decisions and we have to pay attention to things, we have drained the availability of that research for later. And I think Baumeister is an interesting person for our purposes because um, he would look at a lot of the social psychology research today that's based on simulations and uh, computer-based research and say, look, we need to get back to our old school social psychology, put people in situations and see their behavior roots. Um, so he's sort of an old school researcher uh, doing very new school research. Um, so to test this uh, ego depletion hypothesis, you can see he came up with four different experiments. I'll just cover a couple of the interesting ones. First, 
we have the very interesting example of you are brought into a research experiment and you smell freshly baked cookies. And so probably most people walking into that room would feel very hungry. So for example, some people are able to choose whatever they want to eat. Other people are told to eat the chocolate chip cookies. Other people are told to eat the radishes, even though there's the delicious chocolate chip cookie smell in the room. So the idea is that those people who ate the radishes, uh, because that's what they were told, um, would deplete more of their ego resources because they've had to make that decision and keep eating the radishes when they really don't want to. So what does that relate to? Then they had them solve, uh, work on unsolvable puzzles and see how many they tried and how long they persisted in it. And so supporting the ego depletion resource source uh, hypothesis, those who had to use a lot of their uh, self-regulation or uh, exerting will to do something I don't want to do uh, had less available to work on the unsolvable puzzles. And of course, interestingly enough, those who did not have to make a choice at all um, used the least amount of ego and they persisted the longest in trying to solve these unsolvable puzzles before giving up. Another example would be, you would think if you have to give a speech that's against your attitudes, so you are pro-life, but you have to give a speech that's pro-abortion, for example, you would think that that would be a draw on your ego. But in fact, if you have that choice made for you, whether it's against your attitudes or for your attitudes, that does not cause much of an ego depletion because you haven't had to make the choice. Um, but what we really see here is that if you have a lot of choice or if there's um, no control whatsoever, just talk about what you want to, um, that is the key determiner in terms of um, how much ego you have left over for the unsolvable puzzles. So once again, it's not about whether you have to give the attitudinal or uh, counter-attitudinal or pro-attitudinal speech. It's if you are given no choice, um, for example, um, that you persist later on. If you've had to make a choice one way or the other, um, you lose, for example, your resistance or persistence later on. And this means that, for example, you know, if we've had a long day at work um, and we've been good, we're more likely to binge at home and eat too much. Um, so what that means is we need to maybe monitor uh, when our ego or self-regulation resources are down and find out when we're likely to have those resources low and not have, for example, uh, a big bowl of ice cream available when we're at our lowest resolve. Uh, so I, that just means if we know we're going to have low ego resources in our lives, um, we'll have to plan ahead to deal with them healthily um, and anticipate them when we actually get into that state. But that's enough. Uh, thanks for hanging in there for this long narrated slideshow. As you can see, social psychology is a very big field and you can take your discussion in any number of ways. Um, how can we even talk about social psychology in our lives, our family, our jobs, and of course politics if you choose to talk about them. And of course, was there anything from the book that we didn't cover that you have more interest in? Uh, the discussion might be an appropriate place to bring that up. So looking forward to discussing this and more in our class discussion boards.